Ooh. Oh. Yes. Wow, feeling dizzy, yeah? Where's the doctor in the house? Many people have asked me this question. What kept the marathon man going? I find it very difficult to answer that question. I would say, life is like a box of chocolates. And we do not know what does it offer. And I add on and say that no matter what it is, keep on dreaming. And that's what kept me going. In 2009, I decided to embark on a very big marathon in Paris. And I had trained really hard for it. I have two objectives. One was to do my personal best time. And the other one was to propose to my fiancé. And I thought, oh, what other place than Paris? With all the preparation, I was very confident to go into the Paris Marathon. But unfortunately, when the race started, I started to bleed from my nose. And I was getting quite worried. I thought maybe because it was the, the weather condition I was not long enough to acclimatize the weather. And I decided to continue my race. I propelled the racing chair as fast as I can to keep up with the rest of the group. And blood was still dripping from my nose. I wiped it with my wristband. And it was soaking up the wristband. I was getting even more concerned. The thought of giving up in the race came to my mind. But then I remembered I have never ever given up in any marathon race before throughout the 30 years of my racing career. So I persevered and I came to the finish line. And this is a very significant milestone because this is Arc de Trom in Paris. And I was very elated that I've completed the race. I survived the race in spite of the nosebleed. But I was very worried. I rushed back to Singapore, my fiancé, and I was told the very bad news that I have stage 4 leukemia. And I was devastated. I told my cancer doctor, how could it be? I haven't even gone from stage 1, 2, 3, and I jumped to stage 4. And not only that, I always believe that I'm too big to fail. I'm a physician. How could I be a sick person? And not only that, I'm a Paralympic wheelchair athlete. I compete at the highest level. I've taken good care of my health. How could I be a sick man? It was very hard for me to accept the bad news. My oncologist told me that I have only 9 to 12 months to live. And that was so difficult for me to accept because all my life I have believed that I have no limits. Beyond borders, beyond the wheelchair, how could it be nine to 12 months left? But my oncologist was very positive. He wanted me to go through six months of chemotherapy and the bone marrow transplant. And I told him I needed some time to think about it because I've looked after patients who have cancer, who have gone through chemotherapy. And I just find it so difficult to be at the other end to receive treatment that is so toxic. During my reflection, I recall that my life has been full of challenges. It has been a long journey. The time when my parents migrated from China to Singapore and after having two daughters, I came along. And it was such a joy for my parents. As you can see, I, I look so adorable. But the joy was short-lived because two years later, the polio virus came to Singapore and it was a huge epidemic. And because I did not have the vaccination against polio, I became paralyzed from the waist down. And it was so devastating for my young 
for my young parents. I was quarantined in the hospital away from the rest of the world, months of rehabilitation. And when the time came, it was a big decision for my parents because the doctors offered my parents a few options. They offered my parents to have me in the homes and mom and dad were talking to themselves. They related to me their conversation. Dad told my mom, perhaps you could take up the offer, put William in the homes. And mom would say, no, we mustn't take the easy way out. We must give William the love. We must nurture him and help him to maximize his potential in spite of his disability. And dad said, oh, you'll be quite a burden. And mom reminded that we are parents. We need to nurture him and we need to help him win with less. He's paralyzed from the waist down. But William, our beloved boy, is not paralyzed in the brain. He's not paralyzed in his arms. Hey, done. We must help him. And dad was convinced. And mom and dad believed in the power of education. And they went knocking on the doors years later to enroll me in the kindergarten. But a lot of kindergarten at that time, they said no to my parents. And finally, one kindergarten accepted me. But my time at the kindergarten was just very short-lived because I fought with the kids. They came and bullied me and they thought I couldn't run after them and I was very upset. I caught their hands and I bite them. <laughs> that was my way of getting back at them for bullying me, for pulling my ears, for knocking me on the head. So I was expelled from kindergarten and my parents are so disappointed. But they believe that after 11 months, one school might give me a chance. And indeed, they persevered, they kept knocking, and finally, Sligi Primary School gave me the opportunity. And as you may recall, Sligi Primary School is the tallest primary school in Singapore. And the principal told my parents, as long as you are able to help William climb up those stairs, we are willing to give you a praise. My parents was so determined to put me back into the mainstream school. And the rest was history. I was so determined to treasure this opportunity to be in school that I stopped biting anybody. And I say the way for me to go about it is to show to my peers that I am good with my studies and I will win their respect. In the meantime, while studying really hard, my parents were very busy. They were producing more children. And I have four more siblings added to the family. And we were very united as a family. But when I was enjoying the love of the family, I started to visualize my future. And I was thinking, what happened if I don't have my parents anymore? Mom and dad carry me all over the place. And I'm worried. So, I determined in my heart that I'm going to learn how to walk again. And with the help of the hospital, I have my leg braces and crutches. It is very difficult to leave the comfort zone of being carried around with my mother's bosom everywhere I go. But I was very determined to take the first difficult steps. And it took me nine months. There was a lot of falling down, getting up again. But my sister encouraged me and said, William, I don't care how many times you fall down. But it matters to me that when you fall down, you get up again with my help. And I told sis that I'm so touched by her love and her patience with me and I would, I would persevere with her. More than nine months later, I gained the independence. It's a very different kind of world when you have been crawling around, being carried around, and finally able to stand upright. That kind of self-confidence, self-esteem, to be able to be independent. And I started to dream big. 
I realized that I have the capacity to turn a desire into a reality. And I was dreaming about what would I do for my future. And I discovered my interest that I love people. I love to relate with people. Mom and dad found me very talkative. Everywhere, in class or outside, always talking to people. And that's my strength that I discovered that I love to relate with people. So I decided that I want to be a doctor. And it's all about a discovery process where we find where our interests and our passions lie. And then we, 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 went and pers- we would go about pursuing it. I topped the national exam and I went to Raffles Institution. And I was very hungry to excel in education because mom told me, mom and dad say, education can transform my life, can transform my future. So the six years at Raffles Institution, I worked very hard and it was about time to apply to medical school. Sadly, I was rejected and I was very disappointed. But I accepted the offer in life sciences and believed that the setback will be my platform to achieve my dream to become a doctor. Years later, I applied again and I was rejected. But I have learned that I can turn all this rejection into something positive. So I use it to invigorate myself, to re-energize myself to work harder and chase and keep on dreaming. 21 years went by and I went to medical school. It's a long time, isn't it? To finally attain our dreams. I realized from this experience that when one door closed, another door opens. As long as we keep knocking. When I was reflecting on this, I was strengthened. And I became so encouraged to want to go for my treatment. And I found a purpose that if I go for my treatment, I will become a better doctor to be able to help patients at the cancer center where I was working. Transformation starts with us, starts with self. And with this purpose and the meaning that I found, I persevere my treatment. The press caught hold of it that William will never give up a fight. And truly enough, I have this will to survive, to live. After three cycles of treatment, I became weaker and weaker. And honestly, chemotherapy is a very long, tough journey. And even though as a Paralympian, no matter how many years I've put in to train this body, I succumbed to it. I couldn't eat, I was vomiting constantly, and I was neglecting my personal hygiene. I couldn't care about anything at all. I lost the purpose to live because I don't go to the hospital to work anymore. And my coaches wouldn't allow me to go onto the track to train. And I don't find any purpose at all. But it dawned on me that all this while, in my life journey, I have been coping well using various techniques. And why would you, William, suddenly throw all those techniques away and leave and accept this kind of circumstances and this kind of setback in the chemotherapy? And I decided that I must walk the talk. I've been talking about how visualization helps. And indeed, in my journey, whether it be in medicine or in sports, I've used the technique to visualize the process and tap on the powers of mind. And I'm starting to realize that I could use this to visualize this particular race. And this is a race against cancer. Like all the other races, whether they be at the Boston Marathon, how I visualized before I even started the race that I have to go through 
heartbreak heal from mile 18 to mile 22. And it's a constant journey of high elevation. The hills can be so discouraging. Many runners have given up at heartbreak heel. Many wheelchair athletes have given up. But having visualized the process, I learned how to manage my energy to go over the hill and have enough to scale on another hill, another hill. And I remembered also some of the other milestones I had in 2005, how I asked myself, how far do I want to take myself in the field of marathons? And I challenged myself to go and do the Antarctica Marathon. And from Antarctica Marathon, I decided to do even more. I want to achieve a world record of the fastest times of marathon in every continent. The organizers of Antarctica told me, William, it's just not possible. Nobody has ever done a marathon in a wheelchair in Antarctica. But in my heart, I believe the impossible that everybody tells me in my life has always been, I am possible. Thank you. And I realized that throughout my life journey, I have been training and tapping on my mind to have a mindset to think that opportunities offered more opportunities. That instead of looking at problems, learn to see opportunities in problems. My first attempt failed, sadly, because my racing chair broke. My second attempt was also equally a setback because of the snow blizzard. And I went back and I felt angry because I was a victim of climate change, of global warming in Antarctica. And I blamed everything until it dawned on me and William, winners do not make excuses at all. Stop blaming and keep on dreaming even if it breaks the heart. It sounds familiar in the song, isn't it? But don't kill the dream. And I learned to realize that failure is actually part of the success journey, that I can learn many things from it. And I decided that I will go for one more attempt, my third attempt in December 2007. And I learned and I find solutions for all the things I did not do right during the last two attempts. I realized that I was not good at acclimatizing to the weather. So I decided to go to the North Pole. And it is equally challenging in the North Pole. It's about beating the extreme odds, minus 25 degrees Celsius. Some other people have a way of beating extreme odds. I was embarrassed. I had three, seven layers, and this gentleman had nothing on. But nonetheless, the outcome is equally important. The journey and the outcome have to be looked at in the right perspective. Very often, we focus on the outcome and forget about the journey. So both the journey and the outcome plays a very important part. Finally, I completed the North Pole Marathon in 21 hours in the temperature of minus 25 degrees Celsius. And with that, I gained confidence. And I went about my six continents marathon, and finally, I came to Antarctica. It was deja vu. I had that fear. I have a lot of doubts because I failed twice in Antarctica. And for a moment, I started to perspire in my palms and I started to have butterflies in my stomach. At the start line, I was looking for the toilet all the time. And I was asking the organizer, would you mind if I just go to the toilet one more time? And it was just very unusual, because as a doctor, I know this is not the right thing to do. I have nothing. I have just been to the toilet only a few minutes ago. But it was the fear. But I kept telling myself, now visualize the process of this big race. I've trained hard for it, and I have very often repeated the process in my mind. And I have learned 
to set small achievable target during the whole race. And I told myself that the penguins along the way would be my small target. And then the snow-capped hill would be my target. And then along the way, I'll repeat it again and again and again. Because I can't see the finish line. So the way to go is to set small achievable goals. And finally, finally, I crossed the finish line and I broke the world record. 26 days and 17 hours. When I... When all these milestones flashed through my mind when I was visualizing the race against cancer, I was strengthened. And I was determined to go back and continue my cycle four, five, and six. I brought the dumbbells to the hospital ward and started training. And the nurses got worried and told the oncologist, better have William check out because the oncologist wanted to organize a CT of the brain. Along the way, the good news came as well. My oncologist told me, William, I have good news for you. I find for you a bone marrow donor. And that was the best news for any cancer patient. I realized that no matter how challenging the journey can be for any one of us when we keep on dreaming, tomorrow will be a better day that it is important for us to always embrace hope. Hope can be so powerful. There's a saying that goes, tough times never last, but tough people do. Because tough people never, ever, ever give up. Last month, I celebrated my seven years of remission. And every time my oncologists look at me and say, William, I'm so sorry to say that it was nine to 12 months but you're still alive after seven years. I've gone back to look after patients and I realized with my second chance in life comes great responsibility. I can never be super Spider-Man, but I, with whatever strength I have in this wheelchair, will continue to do and contribute. As a physician in the National Cancer Center, I see many patients coming in with some of their concerns. One day, a young girl came in and said, Doctor, I have a lump in my hand. We did the test and we told her there's cancer. It's really sad for a young girl to have cancer. And the, the, the young lady told, the, told, told us, Doctor, can you do something about it? Because I'm in the service industry and my pairs of hands is so important. I can't frighten away my customers. We told her she needed chemotherapy and she got so frightened, she went back. She said, I don't want any chemotherapy. Three weeks later, she came back with this and said, Doctor, this is so terrible. If from a small lump, it's now become such a big, huge one. And it looks so monstrous. And we were very shocked how the cancer cells have grown so fast. We assured her that we'll give her the best treatment. So you see, my friends, there are a lot of needs out there. And upon every one of us, if we find our interests and discover our passions, we can go out there and fulfill a need in the community. And when we go out there, we can make a difference. Last month, I paddled from London to Paris, 400 kilometers to raise money to support cancer research. And when I come to Eiffel Tower, there was a moment of euphoria because Paris, if you remember, I bled and I was diagnosed with cancer. This time around, it was a very special moment. It was a moment of triumph, a moment where, with the help of the right captain, I lift up my bite in celebration. For all of us here, including myself, it's a journey of constant self-discovery, how we can live our life beyond the borders. No matter what challenges lies in front of us, we persevere and keep on dreaming. And I visualize a better world for every one of us because you are great people who are going to create a better future 
for humanity. Thank you. Thank you.